This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Chapter 2 looks at the process of planning and control. This is very much a revision of what you'll have already come across in P3. There are some new aspects, uh, but even when you get onto the more familiar stuff from P3, you should always be thinking in this paper, uh, how will this help us to uh, uh, manage performance? Because that's the name of the paper. We're always reverting back to uh, how can we manage performance to improve performance. Uh, and as we saw in the previous chapter, uh, performance is a very open-ended concept, meaning very different things to different people. The first slide we have here is simply a pretty well-known hierarchy. Uh, there, as we uh, again talked about in the previous uh, lecture, there's the mission, the high-level purpose of the organisation. There I will divide into strategic plans, which are by and large, every time you see a strategic plan mentioned, you should be thinking of something uh, which is going to be ar around uh, five years. Uh, and then that will go down into tactical plans. Think of tactical plans as a budget for one year. And then operational plans can be daily plans. Uh, so that in a hospital, you have to make sure that there are enough doctors and nurses who are um, due to come in. In an airline, you have to make sure the pilots and the, uh, the um, cabin staff uh, have been properly timetabled as well. Before we get on to, to looking a little bit more about the strategic, strategic planning process, uh, we should mention uh, Burns and Scarpins. There has been one question in the past dealing with uh, these writers. Uh, and the main point was that the function of the management accountant has now expanded considerably. Uh, it used to be rather much the management accountant was someone who would record costs and do variance analyses and produce operating statements. Uh, now the uh, management accountant has much more uh, to do with helping management plan for the future. It's now very much uh, moved, as it says, from financial control uh, to business support. And the uh, elements which have uh, caused these uh, changes, uh, first of all, is a change of technology. Uh, a lot of what management accountants used to spend days working out is now done automatically by computer, so they have simply more time to uh, look at other areas, look into the future and so on. Uh, management structure has also uh, changed considerably. Very much uh, organisations are much uh, flatter and wider, uh, and the People at all levels of uh, the uh, structure have to cooperate much more. And finally, there's competition. Competition has increased. In the 1950s, when a lot of management accountant uh, accounting theory was invented, nothing much changed. You'd be doing the same thing in 1955 as you were in 1950. The products uh, would last for a very long time. Now most organisations have to launch new products uh, uh, very often several times a year. So you really have to be on your toes to keep performance uh, up. Strategic management uh, accounting uh, ties in with this. This is very much the idea uh, that management accountants are now providing information to support strategic or long-term decisions in organisations. There is uh, much more emphasis on external information uh, what's happening in our markets, what's happening in our competitors, what prices are they charging, what's happening in the economies in different countries, should we go there, should we withdraw from that country, and, and so on. We have to decide on our strategic um, generic strategy, cost leadership, we have to think, well, how do we keep costs down? If it's differentiation, we have to think, how can we make better products that people are going to be paying more for? We always have to keep in mind what stakeholders may be wanting and what their power is uh, and whether or not they are going to become key players and, uh, and so on. Uh, we have to monitor uh, the key performance 
key objectives, the critical success factors and so on, give feedback and guidance as to whether we're on track or not. And very important, and a great theme almost of this paper, there is this business of non-financial performance measures. We'll come back to this. But as accountants, we tend to think that financial measures uh, are all we need to do. But actually, many financial measures only measure the result. They tell you you've made a better profit or your earnings per share have gone up. They tell you very little about how you've managed to do that. Uh, and the way you may have managed to get your profits up is that we maybe have uh, invented a more efficient way of production. Maybe we have launched new products which command a premium price and widen the profit margin and so on. And uh, the idea of non-financial performance measures may be how much uh, the public likes our products, uh, how much they look on our brand as a brand uh, to be aspired to. The way, very much the way Apple, for example, makes computers, Lenovo makes computers, uh, but Apple makes computers that people are by and large willing to pay a bit more for, for the same sort of computing power. This uh, rational planning model is something or something like what you'd have seen in P3. Uh, it divides uh, strategic planning into three phases. There is, first of all, what's in yellow here uh, is the what's called the strategic position. This is basically gathering information. There is uh, external information, internal information. There's what you share, your big one, your stakeholders want. Uh, there's what you believe you should be doing, what your mission should be, what you think your function is. Based on this information which you've gathered, then you can set objectives and you can make choices. Some choices might be high risk, high return, but then of course some stakeholders might not want that. Other choices might be uh, more safe, but, but, but less exciting if you like, uh, and that might be exactly what your stakeholders want. Uh, uh, some uh, choices may be the wrong things to do uh, if it showed that the economy was going to go down or a recession was about to um, you know, prolong itself for another few years. Based on choice, then there is implementation. That's a hard work that can take years and always very important. And this is where you know, we come back to this business of performance management. Uh, we have to keep controlling. We have to make sure we're on track towards whatever target we've set, but we also have to make sure that the target we've set is still an appropriate one. And when you're talking about a time span of three or five years ahead, things change. Technology changes, the economy changes, the politics change and so on. And it's fair to say uh, that your original plan is not going to be the plan you end up doing. You have to keep monitoring and making sure we're still uh, really maximizing our chances of improving performance. Uh, corporate appraisal, uh, we look at under these uh, headings, uh, external factors, which are really opportunities and threats, internal factors, which are uh, uh, weaknesses and strength. They can be regarded as our resources and competences, what we're good at or indeed what we're bad at the competences that we're strong at or the competences we're weak at. Stakeholder analysis, what do they want out of it? And, and, and indeed, what will they put up with? And gap analysis, uh, which we'll see is the gap between what we're likely to do and perhaps what the head office or our stakeholders actually want us to do. I'm not going to spend very long on Pestel. It is important in this exam. This was the big macro-environmental analysis where you look at uh, P, uh, the politics. Uh, so it could be the European Union expanding or indeed maybe uh, one country leaving the European Union. Uh, within this, there could be a change of government with different spending priorities that will affect organizations. There is economics, boom, bust, interest rates, exchange rates, tax rates. There are social changes like habit, fashion, uh, and of course, what's affecting many countries, increased lifespan and birth rates going down uh, so that uh, there is more opportunity for perhaps organizations in medicines and pharmaceuticals. 
Technological change, of which a huge one, of course, is the internet. How we can gather information, how we can market ourselves, and uh, 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 and all the, the the kind of social uh, uh, approaches that people now take on Facebook and Twitter and so on uh, for marketing. Ecology or environment uh, increasingly important. Increasingly, there's a real cost associated with poor ecological and environmental decisions. Getting rid of waste costs more and more. Uh, many uh, raw materials cost more, so you want to be careful not to waste them and so on. And of course, there's a, a kind of a PR, public relations aspect, uh, to being a good corporate citizen and not releasing pollution, uh, because this could have a real knockback uh, on your marketing. And then there is legal in here, rules, regulations, by and large, there more and more safety rules, safety regulations, more and more rules giving consumers rights, more and more rules giving employee rights and so on, and organisations have to look very carefully at this. Again, just g g going back, just uh, trying to you know, put a little bit of distance between P and 3, P5 here, we are looking at how these macro-environmental items uh, could affect performance. We're trying to manage performance and part of managing performance is understanding what's happening in the environment and reacting in an appropriate way. Again, uh, revision of P3, we zoom down now from the macroeconomic effects into uh, the competitive position of industry sectors. How attractive is an industry? How easy would it be for companies to make profits? Should they go there because it's easy to make profits or should they withdraw from there because it's hard to make profits? Again, that is performance management. And Bordis Five Forces looks at an industry, the car industry, the film industry, the publishing industry, the computer industry. And it looks at uh, competition and rivalry. A lot of competition generally means you're going to be in for a hard time. Lots of people try stealing market share and so on, and you have to keep almost matching their offers. At the other end, if you're something like a monopoly, then you're not guaranteed to make a profit, but uh, your time's going to be rather easier. We can look at potential entrants. Uh, potential entrants are real annoyance because when somebody enters a market, they usually enter with a big splash. Uh, and that usually means high marketing budgets, special offers and so on, uh, to try to attract people across to them uh, for the initial orders. And we have to keep responding to these. If we're in the market already and a potential entrant comes in with a big marketing campaign, we often have to match it not to lose customers. What we're looking for here is a barrier to entry. What cuts down the ease with which new entrants come in? And barriers to entries uh, can be items like capital expenditure. High capital expenditure, high amount of capital being required. Is this risk, you have to go out and get it. Uh, a lot of know-how. Sometimes there are a lot of regulations that you have to pass, if you like, uh, before we're allowed to trade in a particular way. Uh, uh, size can be a barrier to entry as well. If, if, if the, uh, the dominant person in the market has 80% share, then you coming in with maybe 10, 20% share, something of that sort, you're going to find it quite hard to compete. Uh, buyers and suppliers, almost two sides of the same coin. If you're selling 80% of your output to one buyer, uh, then that's tough that one buyer can say reduce your prices by 20% uh, or I go somewhere else and really you won't be able to afford that. What you want to try and do is, is maybe find other buyers to diversify a little bit. Maybe what you do is to say well I'll offer you a price cut if you sign up, sign up for five years then I'm not just living from order to order. Similarly suppliers here if you have a monopoly supplier of a key part uh, that's, it's hard to perform well on that because these monopoly suppliers can 
hike up the price of that part and you have to pay it because there's no one else you can go to. The way we would manage performance there is to try to find other suppliers, maybe to find different uh, components that we could use. Or what we might do if we're really worried about it is we might say, well, the best way to manage our performance and safeguard ourselves there is to take them over. Uh, and then once we've taken them over, we can stop them supplying our competitors. Uh, we, can, we can cut others out of the market. And always there are substitutes. Substitutes often come out of the blue. They usually come through the uh, development of a new technology. You can't really put them back in the bottle once they've been uh, invented. Uh, and quite often what you have to do is to join them. So a substitute to conventional landline phones was, of course, mobile phone technology. And many landline of the old landline phone uh, operators said people will inevitably go to mobile phones for at least part of their calls because of the convenience. Uh, and many landline phone companies of, uh, also decided, well, we'll run a mobile phone company as well so that we keep our market share in the telephone market up. But Porter's Five Forces, really, really important still in P5. Looking outside the organisation, uh, well, I beg your pardon, Looking inside the organisation now, we have the resources and our competences. What are we good at? What do we have a lot of? What are we short of? Uh, what are we bad at? Uh, and many people remember this by a list of M words. So very quickly through, 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 through some of this, there is money, the finance. Uh, are we short of finance? Uh, and if we're short of finance, it means that we can't invest very well, perhaps to improve our performance the first thing we have to do is to get the finance sorted out. Manpower is a rather old-fashioned uh, term now, which would really now be called men and women. It's your human resources. Uh, but for many companies, getting the right human resources is very difficult. People with the right qualifications, especially if birth rates are falling, uh, can put some companies under a lot of pressure. Management, a real problem in smaller companies, smaller family-owned companies, where perhaps the father started the business, now wants to pass on the business to uh, his children, uh, and the children could be a waste of space, really. They're not interested in the business and kind of reluctantly take it on. Even if that's not happening, it can be very difficult for the founder of a business uh, to give... Uh, 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 strength, if you like, to give, to give responsibility to other managers. So the founder of the business, thinking of expanding abroad, but the founder of the business has got no international marketing experience, you have to re recruit somebody who's good at that, and you have to allow them to manage that. You have to let go, because if you don't let go, you will not be performing well. You'll not be maximising the performance that's possible. Manufacturing, uh, we could improve manufacturing perhaps by getting more highly automated, more reliable machines. We might improve it by shifting it offshore so that manufacturing takes place in uh, cheaper economic areas. We need sufficient markets. We need to be good at marketing. We need enough material uh, to allow us to produce what we want to produce. The, the, the mark or the brand name is very important. Uh, a good brand name enables you to launch new products much more easily. A good brand name means that people grab your product almost because of the logo on it, rather than going through a conscious decision, do I want that one or this one? So keeping your brand respectable, keeping it, it, it uh, appreciated by uh, your customers is very important in performance management. Methods or know-how. Uh, know-how, uh, a strong know-how in uh, 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 manufacturing techniques, which are quite difficult, is a strong barrier to entry. Uh, it can help you produce unique products, and unique products, of course, can command a higher price, and so on. 
Many computer companies would like to know how it is that Apple, time after time after time so far, has come up with good ideas. Very good styling, unique interfaces. What is it about the way they design products and design services that makes them better than almost any other phone maker or IT producer? And finally, there is management information systems and IT uh, resources. Uh, this is a, an important resource because your management information system allows you to compile data, allows you to track what's going on, allows you to collect market data and respond to what's happening in either production or the market and thereby to improve performance. The product lifecycle should also be familiar to you from F5 and P3. Again, we want to see how this can be used to manage performance. What should we be looking for uh, at each of these stages? What can we do perhaps to uh, maximize our performance? First of all, the introductory phase. New products being launched. We don't know how it's going to do. Uh, and I suppose there are three things that can happen. It can be uh, a rather poor uh, uh, performance. It can be spot on target or it can be an exceptionally good performance. You might think that if the performance were exceptionally good, let me just get this writing, there we go. If the performance were exceptionally good, there'd be no problems. Uh, but you have to think lots and lots of sales, lots and lots of customers very keen on your product. Uh, you haven't planned to sell that many. Uh, there could be uh, significant waiting lists uh, which could really irritate people and do you harm. If you detect that sales are going really well, then you need to get a move on at really ramping up production. Uh, either yourself putting on new shifts, working weekends, maybe subcontracting some production. What you don't want to do is to have a, a, a popular product and not be able to sell it, uh, simply because you can't make it. That's a kind of more worrying one. Uh, the uh, sales are uh, going, it's not drawn very well, let's try that one again. Uh, the, the sales are going lower than we uh, kind of expect. Disappointing, it could even be lower than that. It could be really implying that the failure uh, of the product is, is almost certain. You don't get very long to rescue products which have launched poorly. They soon gather around them a, a feeling of a poor product or a feeling of failure. And you may only have a few weeks to try to rescue it. What you might do, you might cut selling prices. Uh, you might have special promotional events going on. You might rack up the advertising and uh, so on. Um, but if you do nothing, you're going to be kind of doomed to failure. What you'll be looking at in these uh, these early weeks of uh, sales, uh, you would be watching sales figure, early sales figures like a hawk. Uh, you would be wanting to know as soon as possible the kind of you know the first morning after the product was launched, how are sales going? Uh, you'd be analysing that. Uh, maybe they're going well in the north of the country, not so well in the south of the country, and so on. But you'd be really hungry for that sort of information. Once you get to the, to the to the growth phase uh, here, you have a what looks like it's going to be a success on your hands. Uh, the big danger here is copycats. Uh, many companies have a, a, a policy, a strategy, if you like, not to be first in the market, but to stand around the edges, look for a successful product, uh, and then go for it. And of course, they haven't had the cost of the failures that you might have had being the pioneer. And would it just be awful if you, having taken the risk and got into the market first, if some com com competing uh, product kind of leapfrogged over you uh, and got the highest market share? What you want to do here is to make sure that you stay in front of these latecomers. That may mean uh, advertising very strongly still. It may mean innovating slightly to bring in uh, slightly fresher versions of the product. Sometimes it means withdrawing a product and launching a new one, even whilst the old one is fairly successful, because it kind of opens up the distance between you and these potential competitors. 
At the mature stage here, the market is no longer uh, expanding. Uh, what happens at the, the, the mature phase, there tends to be very intense competition. At the earlier stages here, everybody's sales could increase just by keeping the same share of the market. But once the market isn't increasing, the only way you can increase your sales is by sealing somebody else's, or of course the other way around. What you tend to find here is great competition, great pressure on prices, uh, and 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 really if there's pressure on prices, putting the prices down, the way you are going to get good performance is to get your costs down. So we look, what we're looking at here is great efficiency, and quite often along here there is a process of what's called consolidation. This means that several companies join you together to form uh, one. In other words, getting rid of some of the competition, uh, beginning to operate in a very large scale, because by and large, if you operate in a very large scale, you're going to get your costs down a little bit. Also in here, there's uh, sometimes a process of, of, of shakeout. This is where some companies decide they can't stand the heat. Uh, that they can't uh, bear this very intense uh, uh, price competition and really some really big competitors now and so on. And shakeout means some people leaving. In a decline phase, your major decision really is, am I going to get out of the, 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 the market quickly or am I going to hang in there uh, in the hope this is going to be profitable? And you mustn't think decline is like, three months, six months, something of, something of that sort. Decline can sometimes be like five, ten years. Uh, and there can be good profits available there because really no one in their right mind is going to get into that market. Uh, and you might possibly be the last organisation left standing. How you might improve your performance here is to, uh, to try to uh, find which parts of the market are still thriving. Uh, maybe buy out some of your competitors or uh, so that you have the market left to yourself. Uh, but either get out or to try to get this dominant position in the, uh, the, the, the final phase of the market. Boston Consulting Group Matrix or BCG Matrix, again, something you'll be familiar with here. And we'll go through very quickly the way the, the rationale. We don't have to believe it all. Uh, there, there are some simplifications in it. Uh, but again, the, the, the idea is uh, if we can identify a product in one of these quadrants, this will give us some indication as to what to do with that product uh, to try to improve performance. So I would start up here. So what we have uh, here is a high industry growth rate, uh, but we have a small market share. High industry growth rate implies we're at the early stages of the market. If we went back a one here, kind of this is where you get your your high growth rate. Later on, the growth flattens out. Uh, you have a, a high growth rate here, which means there's a big future in that product or market, as far as we can tell. But we have a low market share, and low market share puts us at a disadvantage uh, in terms of costs. Uh, we spend advertising, but we don't get a lot of sales for it. We have relatively inefficient manufacturing because we're too small. Uh, if you're a small manufacturer, you don't have great bargaining power with your suppliers. And the BCG people put great store on the idea that big is beautiful. Uh, that if you were staying here with a kind of 5% uh, market share, and incidentally relative market share, means your share over the largest share so 5% equates to about a 20th uh, you're a 20th of the size of the largest uh, player in the market you're, you're really very weak uh, and these larger companies could just kind of uh, click the fingers uh, spend a little bit more on advertising uh, uh, reduce their costs for, for three months, uh, and, and you would be blown out of the, the water, really. So what you have to do here is you either have to get out of the product, or what you have to do is to spend money. So this is going to be cash negative. 
Uh, what we're trying here is to build a product the way you're going to the way you're going to uh, uh, improve performance is by grabbing more market share. You're going to make losses here. Very likely you're going to make losses here. It would be inappropriate uh, to give the managers of, say, this uh, subdivision, it would be inappropriate to give them a, a kind of target of making profits. Uh, because we're not in the game really making profits here. At this stage of the product, what we want to do is to build market share. And if you were in some way um, uh, trying to line up um, um, rewards, bonuses and so on to performance, you would be better doing it on market growth or your, the growth of market share. When you get to the star here, this is normally regarded as about cash zero. Uh, what we're trying to do here is to hold. Uh, a hold here is in the, the idea of holding a, a military position. Uh, you're now the big player. Lots of other companies will be on your heels trying to steal your market share. You have to defend yourself. You still have to spend quite a bit of money on advertising, maybe putting in special offers, maybe freshening the product, bringing out Mark II, Mark III of the product, and so on to keep ahead there. Again, profits, stars aren't as good as they sound. Profits may be just a little bit elusive here. And, and if you are trying to encourage people to do the right thing here, you want them to hang on to this market share. Because what you're hoping for is the big reward down here uh, cash cow is always going to be cash positive. This is sometimes called the harvest stage. A bit like a, a farmer in, in the, the early uh, parts of the year, you have all the hard work. Uh, and then towards the end of the product's life, when now it has a, a low growth rate, uh, you sit back and enjoy the, the riches you hope are coming your way. It becomes a positive cash flow because down here, when you have got uh, low uh, industry growth rate, people see this as an old product. It's kind of maybe begun to decline or the next phase is going to be decline. And nobody's going to make a concerted effort to get into that. So they leave you on your own, really, uh, to, to enjoy this little product, which they believe on its, it's on its way out. Here, uh, what you need to do is to make sure you get the harvest you need to conserve costs. You need to become very efficient. We should be efficient. We're way down the uh, experience curve. We've depreciated all our machinery and so on there. Uh, we might uh, withdraw a little bit on some of the uh, promotion. We don't have to be quite so aggressive. But this is where we get the payback, really. Uh, and this is where it would be appropriate maybe to give somebody an incentive scheme, which is based on hitting profits. Out here, this is really a non-starter. Uh, the dog product, it had a low industry growth rate, uh, it, it was on its way out, we didn't have a big market share anyway. All you can really do there is get out of the thing as fast as you can, so it's going to be to divest. SWOT analysis uh, brings together the external, the uh, opportunities and threats, and the internal, the M words, the money, the management, the machinery, the marketing, the the, the, the know-how, and, and and so on. Again, we, we we you know just identifying what's a strength and a weakness is pretty pointless. Identifying what's an opportunity and a threat is rather pointless. What you should always be saying is, and so what? You know the the economy is forecast to increase. So what should we do? Perhaps build another factory. The economy is forecast to go down, you should be thinking, and so what? Uh, and perhaps it is to close some factories, it would certainly not be to open more factories and, and so on. If you discover that your uh, international experience is uh, rather poor, your marketing experience internationally is very poor, uh, you have to say, and so what? Do I actually need it? I mean, have I got any sort of plans to go? marketing abroad. And if you have, you, you can't do this with poor marketing. You, you, can't, you, can't, you, 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 you can't really make progress from a position of weakness. Now putting it, the, the SWOT analysis into this shape is, is, is really quite helpful because it tells us or gives us a clue 
uh, how our information can then be used to improve and manage our performance. So if we have a strength and a weak and a big bottom opportunity there, that's really a marriage made in heaven. Uh, the opportunity uh, might be uh, an economy abroad doing quite well. Our strengths are we've got lots of money and we have uh, a lot of international experience. There should be relatively little, maybe a strong brand name. It should be relatively easy for us to go into this new overseas market and, and, and conquer it. Uh, and, and, and that's good. What happens if we have an opportunity and a weakness? You know, so again, we have the opportunity of opening abroad in a new market, uh, but we have no marketing experience internationally, perhaps a bit short of money, and perhaps we don't have the right production capacity and so on. We have no hope, really, of making a success, of improving our performance by trying this uh, venture of opening abroad if, if we don't really have the, the right resources and competences to do it. So what you need to do first is to make sure you have those resources and competences. Raise more money, employ the right people, set up the right factory and so on. A threat here, if uh, you can find it, uh, you might be able to use one of your strengths to offset that. So if there's a threat coming from perhaps an overseas company coming into your country, the, the sort of strengths people try to, to to, to play, uh, are they will say, well, we're a traditional company, we employ people here, we have a good brand name. Uh, you should support the local industry rather than, rather than you know supporting overseas industries and overseas workers. Uh, uh, and finally, we have this uh, bottom one here, where we have got the uh, uh, a weakness and we have a, a threat in there as as well. There we go, we're right with that. Very difficult to do anything about that. There's a threat. It's pointed directly at your weakness. Uh, you probably have to shut up, really. Go home, almost. Uh, it happened in the, the, the UK car industry in the 1950s and 60s with kind of very famous uh, makes like Austin, Morris, Rover. Um, our big weakness was quality. Uh, not very innovative in terms of new engineering and so on. And the threat that we uh, had came from Japanese uh, companies. Uh, the Japanese companies came in with excellent quality, new cars, quite innovative and so on. Uh, and despite uh, struggling for some years, essentially the home-based UK car industry died. One or two areas were left, but by and large owned by foreign companies. So maybe what we should do to improve performance in that situation is to recognize uh, how poor our situation is and uh, perhaps to surrender with as much dignity and as little cost as possible. Gap analysis. Uh, gap analysis looks at the difference between what we will be doing uh, if we kind of go along more or less as expected without any big changes uh, and maybe what our bosses or our stakeholders want us to do, which is up there, the, the target. Uh, we have a gap and we have to try and f f fill that in, in some ways. Uh, there are different ways of categorizing it. The first one we've got here is efficiency gains, uh, cost cutting. Cost cutting will help you improve your profits. And then what you have is uh, an expansion gap. Uh, you could try to go from 19% of your market to 22% of your market. That's expansion. You could try expanding abroad. You could try expanding your product line. All of these are potential ways, not guaranteed, but potential ways of improving your profit performance. Uh, and then, and maybe the size, sign of a, a desperate manager, diversification, where you decide to branch out into something really different. I would say, in general, if, if this is floated in front of you as a way of closing a gap, uh, be very wary about it. Diversification means going into an area of business about which you know nothing or have very little experience. Uh, there's a very high risk there that you're going to get it wrong. And quite often, in fact, in these diversification attempts, 
value is destroyed. People maybe take over uh, another business which is quite radically different to them. They try to manage it in the wrong way uh, and five years later they sell it back to the original owners for about 25% of the price. ASOS Matrix is a, a neat way uh, of uh, really, I think of it as, as, as explaining really kind of gap analysis in another way here. Uh, it, it's great because it, it, it summarizes just about everything you can do to improve profits. So the top left matrix where you stay with your present product and your present market, there is efficiency gains, cost cutting. There is penetration, that's going from 19% of the market to 23%. Uh, there is withdrawal from a market. Perhaps it is actually loss-making, or perhaps you spend an awful lot of effort there uh, for very little reward, and it would be better closing that one down and, and, and spending that effort redeploying those people where they manage to earn more. Consolidation. Consolidation is where you basically join, uh, take over, merge, if you like, with uh, other companies. Uh, this uh, can open the way, of course, towards efficiency gains. Uh, by and large, each of these here is relatively low risk and relatively low return. Uh, you're not going to you know, shave 50% off the costs of the stroke. You're not going to go from 20% market share to 50% market share anytime soon. Uh, withdrawing from a market. I mean, I mean, you are retrenching. You, you, you know, you have to be left with something. Uh, and the 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 cost savings and consolidation are probably going to be modest as well. So, don't think you're going to be kind of doubling profit or increasing profit by twenty five percent by any of these. These tend to be relatively modest gains, but pretty safe. Second ones here: we have product development and we have market development. Uh, a bit more risky, but obviously the chance of much more uh, increase in returns. Uh, product development implies uh, that you are going to be spending some money researching and developing for the new product. Uh, I'm going to spend that up front. Market development implies maybe you're opening up some sort of a factory or distribution uh, services abroad. Both of them imp imply money up front and, and neither is guaranteed to be successful. Obviously, if it, they are successful, you, you could double profits. Uh, but remember that the, 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 the foreign competitors that you now have, the country that you're moving into, they will retaliate. Uh, remember that the, the product developments, other people will see what you're doing, and they will try to, to retaliate, to try to copy, and, 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 and so on. And then there is that diversification, related, non-related. Uh, and I would be very, very wary about unrelated diversification. This is a bit like a supermarket joining with a house building company. Uh, where are they going to get increased profits from? They can't save any costs. They, they are completely different. It requires different financing, different selling, different marketing, different manufacturing and so on there. Uh, and this usually means that value is going to be destroyed. Related diversification in a little bit more of a hope with. This is where there's some connection or with some logic between two, two companies. Uh, and a good example, perhaps, of that is uh, SAS, which is uh, Scandinavian Airline Service, and Radisson. Uh, Radisson is a chain of hotels, uh, and, and they are essentially in one group now. And there are many Radisson hotels at airports. And you can see how if you're booking a flight, it leaves early in the morning, they could offer you, the, you know, a room the night before and, uh, and so on, maybe at a special rate. But uh, they're, they're basically cross-selling. So cross-selling or saving some costs are uh, available in most related diversification to improve performance. They are almost by definition unavailable in unrelated diversification. Neither customers nor costs uh, have anything in common. Multinational considerations uh, here. Uh, just uh, a few things to, to think about if we were going internationally uh, here, why it maybe gets a little bit more uh, complicated, or what we might decide to do to maximize our performance. 
We have to be wary that there are some administrative overheads. We are dealing now in a different legislation with different laws and different taxes uh, and different cultures indeed. Uh, and that's going to take uh, some cost to, to get over. We can have process specialization. This means that you, for example, decide you have your research and development in one country, maybe you're manufacturing in another country, uh, and maybe your finance department is, is actually centralized in a third country. So you do your R&D, where there are plenty of uh, qualified engineers, you do your uh, uh, manufacturing, where wages are low, uh, you do, I suppose, your accounting where there are plenty of qualified accountants uh, around. You can have product specialization. Not all countries uh, like or want the same products. Uh, and you have to be wary of trying to sell the same product to all countries. It's probably not going to work that well. It will need at least a bit of tailoring. There is economic risk. Economic risk is really coming from exchange rates. Now we're not dealing here uh, with what's called transaction risk and exchange rates, where when you come to, to change your, your, let's say, euros to dollars, you, you, you get a, a different amount. Uh, what we're dealing with here is, is really competition. So if I'm in the UK exporting to America and the US dollar weakens, the pound sterling strengthens, uh, then when my goods go to America, and the price is converted into dollars, it's going to be relatively expensive for Americans. Similarly here, if the pound weakens, uh, if, if, if goods are being imported to the country and the, the pound weakens, they're going to be more expensive in this country and so on. So it's really to do with your competitive uh, position as exchange rates go, go up and down. And of course there are political risks. Uh, uh, countries are subject to political change, sometimes uh, democratic change, sometimes more uh, violent change, sometimes there are uh, outbreaks of uh, unrest, sometimes laws are passed in some countries which enforce particularly onerous regulations. Uh, all of this, all of this can, can happen, some of it's quite hard to predict, uh, but we need to be just, just aware of it. Benchmarking. Benchmarking really goes back, I think, to setting objectives. Uh, we said that objectives had to be acceptable, they had to be achievable. Uh, we want objectives uh, to be achievable, yet uh, stretching. If you set objectives which are too low, you tend to pull down performance. If they're too high, people tend to give up. How do we know when we set an objective that it is a good objective, a, 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 a valid objective for people to take to take on? And basically benchmarking is the process of comparison. It can even go back to missions. If you say our mission is to be the best car maker in the world, the very use of the word best implies we've got some scale, some way we can compare ourselves uh, to other car manufacturers. Or if you say in your generic strategies, we are going to be a cost leader, the lowest cost producer, it implies you know what other people's costs are and you set yours below. It's essentially comparison, benchmarking. The three main types of benchmarking are set out here. Internal, uh, compare what you do to an internally set measure. Now, it has to be justified by something. You can't, you can't just sit in the dark room and say, well, I think the, the, the time to produce this, this unit is 17 minutes. Generally what you're doing here is this internally generated target has to be made valid uh, either by previous years or perhaps you've got different branches. So if one branch uh, achieves a gross profit of 20%, and the other one achieves a gross profit of 25%, uh, you might want to say to all of them, well, I think you should achieve 25%, because if they can do it, you can do it. But you can't just pluck 25% out of the, the air. Similarly, looking at previous years, uh, you can uh, set uh, uh, an objective next year by comparing to last year and say, well, I want you to improve slightly. External, 
compare how you're doing to what basically your competitors are doing. You can do that with their published figures, their financial statements, but actually the most interesting information is probably secret. We would love to know how long it takes a company to produce their product. We would love to know uh, what their product costs to produce, but why would they tell you in a competitive situation? Non-competitive uh, benchmarking tends to happen in non-profit-seeking situations. Uh, in the UK, again, the government is very keen on um, league tables, which is a form of benchmarking, and it gets hospitals to uh, publish their success rates with operations. It gets schools uh, to publish how their uh, pupils do in uh, state exams and so on. Now there, you're not giving anything away. The, the government says you have to publish what these rates are. Uh, and what they're trying to do is to get everyone up to the best. And then it could be process or activity where you don't look at the whole organization. You look at a single activity or a single process. Uh, and, and, and sometimes this is done uh, really for best in class. So if you take, uh, let's say, a supermarket, supermarkets tend to be really good at inventory. A supermarket doesn't want to run out of inventory, it doesn't want to have too much inventory because the food will go off and, uh, and, 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 and so on. Uh, and they tend to be absolutely excellent at inventory management. And you get uh, another organization, uh, quite different, but nevertheless, it's an inventory problem. So let's say a pharmacy in a hospital. A pharmacy in a hospital, you don't want it run out of certain uh, vital drugs. But, but drugs also have a shelf life. You don't want too many of them that have to be thrown away. Uh, and uh, it, it's quite possible that pharmacies could learn some tricks from supermarkets uh, to know the percentage of stockouts, a percentage of time where the right stock isn't there, uh, to know the percentage by value that maybe has to be thrown away, uh, could help pharmacies perhaps try to claw their way up, as far as possible, given that they're in slightly different contexts, claw their way up to the performance of the best. Johnson & Scholes uh, suggests uh, three ways uh, of uh, evaluating our strategic options. Uh, they say before you can go forward with any strategic option, it really has to pass three, three tests. First of all, you should assess, is it suitable? So we said before, if the economy is forecast to decline, an unsuitable strategy would be one which implies you're going to increase the number of factories that you have, that will not improve performance. There has to be a kind of match, if you like, between what you are doing and what's happening in the environment. That's the only way you're going to get improved performance. Secondly, it has to be acceptable, and this is acceptable really to your stakeholders. Uh, of course, we've already said that it's difficult to keep all stakeholders happy all of the time. Uh, but you have to at least make sure that what you're proposing is acceptable to your key players. If you're proposing something which is not acceptable to customers, they'll leave and go somewhere else. If you're proposing something which is totally unacceptable to employees, they may go and strike or they may leave and go somewhere else, taking valuable, valuable customers with you. If you are proposing something which is uh, unacceptable to the government, they will become a legislate. So again, to, it almost gets back to what is meant by performance. Uh, performance is in the eye of the beholder. It, it, it's really what the key players require of you. And finally, it has to be feasible. Can we do it? Do we have the money, the resources, the management, the marketing expertise and so on there? Uh, if, if those are not in place, then we are wasting our time. Try, it's just a dream trying to pursue uh, a particular strategy if we don't have the resources in place. Very quickly, advantages and disadvantages of uh, strategic planning. 
uh, here. I'm not going to spend very long on this uh, 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 at all. Uh, just I'll just point out two of them really here during the lectures. First of all, it should improve coordination. Uh, you may have come across organizations which seem to be in chaos and they give you no confidence. If you've worked for them, they give you no satisfaction as an employee. Uh, at least proper planning should mean make you coordinated uh, and, and should mean that there's less waste uh, and all of that's going to improve uh, performance. Secondly, maybe you can control the future. You look into the future and you see something you don't like, maybe a proposed law. What you can do is maybe to try to put some pressure on government to try to lobby, advertise, get a newspaper on your side, perhaps to get that changed slightly. But above all, uh, strategic planning forces you to look ahead. We know that strategic planning can't foretell the future perfectly. There are always going to be surprises and bumps in the road that we haven't expected. But if you walk along with your eyes closed without any sort of strategic planning, you are going to continually bump into things and trip up. At least with strategic planning, you're going to see some of the difficult areas. Potential disadvantages of strategic planning. These are the, uh, the, the main ones. Uh, the... Um, all come down to the same thing, really. Almost too much time spent planning. Nobody makes money planning. You make money by doing. And at some stage, you have to you know, give up risk avoiding. You have to make the decision. Uh, you have to put your money where your mouth is and you have to do it. But there are people, managers, who prefer to plan than to do. And of course, it means that uh, you miss opportunities. Inflexibility, no plan is going to be correct. We said earlier on that control of the strategic planning process is very important. Uh, your plan will not be right. You have to be willing to change it. And changing it is not a sign of weakness. And of course, planning does have a cost and time and money. You've got meetings of people uh, and maybe their time could be better spent doing other things. Finally, here are suitable questions for this uh, chapter. Uh, they uh, deal with there's some pest analysis in there, there's some Porter's Five Forces in there, and uh, some, so on, some uh, uh, benchmarking in, in there. So it, it's good to have a, a look at those at some stage.